If I were to say to you that the end of the world is at hand, that we are living in the last days, that the end of all time is very near, you might not actually be surprised. In fact, you might say, you know, RD, I read the news, I see the social turmoil all around us. I see that a virus has literally taken over the world and ground everything to a halt. Uh, perhaps you would point to our prime minister who talks about the Great Reset, or maybe you would even look to our neighbors to the south and say, watch as their entire system, their democracy appears to be crumbling. Well, those are certainly some things that people point to to say that we are in the last days, but Christian men and women know that we are in the last days for a very different reason. We know that we are in the last days because the Bible tells us so. In fact, in one sense, Christians know that the last days, in the biblical sense, began with Jesus coming, his living his life, his death on the cross, his rising from the grave, and his ascension to heaven. That marked what Christians call the last days. And so, in one sense, we are living in those last days, and certainly, with the passing of every second, with the passing of every day, we draw nearer to the final day, what scripture refers to as that great day when Jesus will return. And so friends, it's with that in mind that for the next two months or so, we're going to be looking at Revelations chapter 1 uh, through to chapter 3. We're going to look specifically at the letters to the seven churches in Asia. Okay, that's what's contained primarily in chapters uh, two and then in chapter three, uh, these letters to the seven churches in Asia. In one sense, these letters were written to particular churches. Like back in the time of the book of Revelation, when John wrote this, you could actually go to the street address of each one of these churches. So these were particular churches that these letters were being written to. But in another sense, the number seven tells us that they are symbolic, that these seven churches represent all churches throughout all time. We're going to look at those seven letters to the seven churches with one dominant question that runs all the way through this series. And the question is, how to be the church in the last days? You could frame it another way and you could say, what kind of church does God want us to be in the end times? Well, those are the questions that we're going to be looking at. Um, over the next couple of months. But first, before we dive into those seven churches, we're going to spend the next two weeks in chapter one looking at a different question. And the question that we want to look at for the next two weeks deals with what is the book of Revelation? How do we in the 21st century in Northeast Burlington, how do we as the church receive it? How do we read it? How do we apply it to our lives? It's interesting that polls and surveys have been done that show very clearly that when people in congregations are asked, what is the one book in the Bible that you most want your pastor to preach on? The answer is consistently the book of Revelation. Now, conversely, polls have been done that ask pastors, what is the book of the Bible that you least want to preach on? And the answer is the same, the book of Revelation. Why is that? Well, I think it's a difficult book. Okay, It's a book that many Christians would shy away from because they have no idea what it means. You know, there's all these strange images and things that are hard to unpack and appropriate and understand. I think some people shy away from it, frankly, because they find the book scary. And so they just try to avoid it altogether. I think there's a different and opposite reason why some pastors try to steer clear of it. And that's because even though some people steer clear of it, they're uncertain on it, they may be afraid of it, there's another cohort of people that are all too confident in their particular interpretation and application of Revelation. You know, they have charts and timelines and graphs and, and they bring the wrong questions to bear on the text. And so when we come to the book of Revelation, we really do come to something that is in Scripture, but very, very difficult to read and to understand but you know as well as I do that Christian men and women avoid this book to their peril. It's important to read and study and dissect and apply the book of Revelation, uh, first of all, because it's in the Bible, right? We as Christians 
believe that God has spoken to us in a book. And so anything that's in that book, anything that's within the canon of scripture, it behooves us to roll up our sleeves, do the hard work, read it and study it and apply it to our lives because it is God's word to us. And so we read the book of Revelation because it's in the Bible. I think we also need to read the book of Revelation because it serves less as a particular timeline and more as a guide for every generation of Christians. So, so let me say it this way. You know, the fascinating thing about how God arranged for this book of Revelation to be written and captured and preserved in scripture over time is that every generation of Christians has been able to read it and apply it to their generation. Okay, that's a remarkable thing about this revelation. So you have every generation of Christians who could look out at their world, see the wickedness, the brokenness, the evil, the sin, and clearly identify the abomination of desolation, if you, if you will. Or clearly identify a government that was the whore of Babylon in their generation. See, this is how revelation works. There's this sense that it is um, capturing the paradigm of the now. It's an urgent book because it speaks in the last days to situations and scenarios that are happening in every generation throughout history. But it's also important to read this book and to understand it and to apply it to our lives because of an invitation, a promise that you might have heard captured in verse 3. Let me read it to you. It says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. So John is writing this, and he says it's not only important for us to read because it's part of Scripture. It's not only important for us to read because it speaks timelessly to God's people in these last days. But John even goes further in this revelation. He says it's important for us to hear it, to read it out loud, and to obey it, to keep it, to guard it. This is uh, an invitation with two parts as we head into this book of Revelation. The first one, it says, is to read it aloud, right? Read out loud. That's how you're blessed. Well, this word read out loud is a word that uh, occurs very sparingly in the New Testament, anagonoso, anagonosco. And it carries with it this semantic range. You know, it has, it has a range of meaning. One of the readings is to read it out loud. Another is to distinguish between or to recognize or to accurately acknowledge and know. So the promise in this first chapter, verse 3 of Revelation, is that we are invited to read accurately know, uh, distinguish between. You see, do you hear the precision that it's inviting? The, the, the invitation here to reading Revelation is not just the invitation to quickly gloss over or to treat lightly or glibly or to superimpose our own ideas on top of or to try to leverage the images in Revelation towards something that serves our ends. No, 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 no. The invitation is to read it aloud. Anagonosco to dig right in and to distinguish between, to intimately know this prophecy. The second invitation in verse 3 is not only to read it aloud, but also, it says, to hear it and to keep it. Well, literally, it says to hear it, and I think that's pretty obvious in its meaning. But this idea of keeping this prophecy, well, when we move through Revelation over the next couple of months, uh, the invitation here to keep it is literally to tend to it, to carefully guard it like you would a treasure, to keep it. Okay, so here, here's the picture of, of what we're promised in verse 3. We're promised that people will be blessed. People will be blessed simply means happy, but in a deep sense, not a superficial way. It, the, the invitation is that when you come to Revelation, you will be blessed, happy, come what may, with an abiding sense of joy 
no matter how the world is falling apart, if you intentionally read this prophecy, wrestle with it, live under it, understand it. Secondly, hear it and keep it as a treasure. This book of Revelation is well worth studying. It's well worth our attention for the next couple of months because these last days uh, that we live in are marked by misinformation or disinformation. You know, I think one of the biggest challenges in our world today is our apparent inability to truly get to the bottom of any news story or any social dynamic. We have uh, competing news sources that are lived out on, on cable news, but also in newspapers and online and in social media outlets that have been polarized and siloed and polemic against one another such that we are being fed a steady stream of information that we all live in echo chambers and we cannot understand people's other point of view. And so we have to sit back and even question the information that we're getting. I think one of the things that marks these last days is confusion and an inability to get at trustworthy information. And so in the face of that, the invitation to study Revelation is an invitation to a truly happy and blessed life when we read, carefully, accurately, know, hear, and guard these words. So that's why, that's why we're looking at that book of Revelation over the next couple of months. The next question is, what is contained in this revelation? If it's so important that we come to know it and study it and hear it and keep it and guard it, what is contained in this revelation? Well, in desperate times and in uncertain days, uh, many of us think that our peace and our happiness and our joy will be found by knowing more information, right? By uh, really getting to the bottom of things. Or, or maybe we think that peace and stability and joy will be found by knowing the future, knowing what's going to happen next. Some people bring that assumption to their reading of the book of Revelation. They open it up and they try to read it like some kind of biblical crystal ball. But listen to chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and you'll hear exactly what the book of Revelation is truly about. Listen to this. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Friends, don't, don't miss this truth as we head into Revelation. This book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Period. Full stop. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so we need to approach it as such. That's what we have in this book is a revelation of the Lord. In these end times, in these perilous days that lie ahead for the church and for individual Christians, the question is, what do you most need? What do you most need? And the answer from the book of Revelation is that difficult times are coming times of, of hardship and suffering and loss, of refining, of rebuking, times of peril. But in the face of those, the church and the individual Christian most needs a fresh vision of Jesus. That's what's revealed to us in these last days. And so we will be reading the book of Revelation the same way that we are encouraged to read all of Scripture. We read it looking for Jesus. You know, that's, that's how we read every book of the Bible. We read every book of the Bible looking for who Jesus is, what he has done for us on the cross, it, how our sins ought to convict us and press us more and more into hope that can only be found in him. We ought to read Revelation the same way we read other books of the Bible, um, allowing our sins to be convicted, stripping us of self-righteousness, pressing us into a hope that can only be found 
anchored in a full revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 1, I want to dive into this a little further. It says that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And this paints a fulsome picture for us as we launch into this series, because um, people who specialize in grammar would tell you that there are different genitive possibilities. So in other words, the moment that you use the word of, you're venturing into the grammatical land of genitive constructs. And there are many different possibilities of what it can mean. And, and in this case, the range would include, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It could mean that this is the revelation given from or by Jesus Christ. But it's more likely from the grammar and from what follows that this is the revelation about Jesus Christ. And when you take sort of all three of those possibilities, I don't think they're mutually exclusive here in verse one. We are being told at the very onset of revelation that this is the revelation um, from and by Jesus Christ. And it's also the revelation that is fully about Jesus Christ. That's what we are wading into. The, re the, the revelation in verse 1 goes further, and not only does it say it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, but it then breaks down this sort of chain of communication. It says that this revelation of Jesus Christ is from God about Jesus. It's given through an angel. Bear in mind, angel simply means messenger. And it's given to John, John the Apostle, in exile near the end of his life on the island of Patmos. It's given from God about Jesus through an angel or a messenger to John, to Christian servants like you and me concerning these last days. That's what we're looking at. Let's be super clear about this before we move any further into Revelation. God wants you and me to desperately know one thing in these last days. He wants us to know Jesus. He wants us to venture into these days that lie ahead, no matter how they might look, no matter what may come with social structures and governmental structures and economics and health and even persecution. There's one thing that God wants you to know clearly as you venture into these days as the church and as an individual Christian. He wants you to have a full revelation of Jesus. And so we read, we study, we guard, and we obey in order to keep Jesus in these last days. And the promise from verse 3 is that that is what will make us blessed. That is what will make us happy. It's a great tragedy of our day that the more wild things get in these present crises, the less Christians seem to read their Bibles and pray. You know, the more we seem to pay attention to news stories and news outlets and, and get sucked into various forms of information that may or may not at the end of the day prove helpful, when what God wants for us is that in these last days, we would see Jesus Christ afresh revealed to us and that he would be our hope. So what is this revelation that we're dealing with? What's it telling us? It's showing us Jesus. Well, it goes on in verse 4. We've looked at verses 1 through 3. I hope you have it in front of you. In verse 4, it says, um, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before the throne. So, this is very clear, and this is what we're not going to get into it today because we're going to delve into this over the next few months very slowly and methodically, the seven churches. But this revelation of Jesus Christ from God through a messenger, an angel, to John, to the servants of Christ in these last days is a message to the churches, to us at St. George's. And I think we ought to pay particular attention to it because it is the only time in the New Testament where the head of the church addresses particular specific churches. And, and it's important for those churches at that time in that context, 
But as I said earlier, it transcends because seven churches, figured at least, the number seven represents the fullness of all things. And the message is Jesus Christ speaking to every church that will ever exist throughout time in these last days. Now, as we move through these over the next couple of months, you're going to see that two of those churches are commended and two and five of those churches are condemned. And so the words that Jesus is going to speak to those seven churches really only fall into two different categories. The one is uh, words of encouragement to persevere in the face of suffering for the two churches that are on the right track. And for the five churches that have missed the mark, his word will be a word of rebuke and a call to repent. So this revelation is to those seven churches and it's to us. I want to cycle back to this idea that the entire book of Revelation is actually a revelation of Jesus Christ. So if that's true, what is it revealing? What is it showing us of Jesus? Well, I want to look at the next verse. We now look at verses 1 through 4. Look at verse 5, and you'll see how there's a picture here given of Jesus that is then unpacked and applied throughout the rest of the letter of Revelation. Listen to verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom of priests, to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Did you hear that in verse 5? These four truths of Jesus revealed to us, the first one, He's a faithful witness. The second one, firstborn from the dead. Third one, he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. Fourth, he's the one who loved us and freed us from our sin by his blood. Well, I want this morning just to touch very quickly on the first two. Um, Jesus is revealed to be a faithful witness and the firstborn from the dead. As a faithful witness, we know from the Gospels and from the New Testament reflections on the life, death, burial, resurrection, ascension of Jesus, that he was a faithful witness because he did what we were supposed to do and could never accomplish. He lived a life of unwavering faithfulness to God, even to the point of death. And so he bore witness to all of creation, the goodness of God and the goodness of his word. Unwavering, Jesus is a faithful witness revealed to us. The second one is that he's the firstborn from the dead. And in this picture, we see revealed to us Jesus who conquered our final foe and is now leading the parade to the new heavens and the new earth, right? He's not just, it doesn't just say that he conquered death. It says that he was the firstborn from the dead, which implies that this revealed picture of Jesus that gets us through the last days is not just that he conquered death, but that he's the firstborn, implying that many more will come behind him. Well, those are the first two things that are revealed to us. I want to spend a little bit more time on the next two, okay? Because I think that they speak to us in this present day. These are equal and opposite truths about Jesus that speak in particular to our lived experience of living in the last days as Christians. These days of crisis and uncertainty. The first one, it says, that Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth. And the second one, that he has freed us from our sin, making us a kingdom of priests. Okay. These, no doubt, are tumultuous days for Christian men and women. They are uncertain days, even for the church. You know, I have seen... Um, and in many conversations that I have with other church leaders, there are competing ideas even as to what faithfulness looks like in these days for the church. And, and right here, I think we are given some insight and some answers. How should the church live out in days like these? What, what should we do? Because we often find ourselves faced with competing values. On the one hand, we are faced with Passages like Romans 13 that would be biblical injunctions to civil obedience. 
right, to praying for and obeying governmental authorities. And yet at the other, on the other side of the coin, we know that there are places for civil disobedience, that faithfulness to God will at some point tip over and demand civil disobedience and divine obedience from Christians and from churches. And so how do we navigate that? How do we get through that in these last days? I find great comfort in the fact that this is not the first time that churches have had to face these questions. These times are difficult for the church, difficult for Christians, but can I suggest to you that they are actually good times? Because it's in wrestling through these questions and even disagreeing with one another graciously and and listening and thinking and praying and delving into scripture that we are in fact refined. That the strength of the anchor of our faith holds fast and holds stronger. It's through wrestling with these questions in difficult times that we actually come to a greater, stronger faith. Well, you know my love for the Protestant Reformers, and a friend of mine recently wrote an article that I'm happy to share with you. If you want to email me, I can send you a copy of it. And in it, he outlines both Martin Luther and John Calvin's position on civil disobedience and civil obedience, and how does that play out in the life of the Christian and of the church. And he he demonstrates quite nicely in this article the both Luther and Calvin would have said that the church and every person in time and in history lives under two God-ordained authorities. Two God-ordained authorities. The one is the church. You know, we look at our church structures and we even call them ordained ministers of God, right? And that's one that's one authority that we live under. And And Luther and Calvin would have said that we also live under the God-ordained authority of the civil magistrate. That no civil magistrate has any authority apart from what's been given him by God. And so we live our life under these two God-ordained authorities. You can hear it in verse 5. This deep truth that in these last days, Jesus Christ, listen, is both ruler over the kings of this earth and has freed us from our sins. In other words, the church. Luther and Calvin would both agree that Christians may reach a point of civil disobedience, but that it always must be passive disobedience and not active. In other words, you passively say to the state, I cannot do that. And then you willingly accept whatever punishment and whatever hardship and suffering and you persevere faithfully, it would come what may. But both Luther and Calvin would have also said that when we as Christians must be civilly disobedient, that we have to find legal ways to do so. So that means in our context, maybe writing letters to our MPs, peacefully protesting, voting, Right? Those are all ways that we as Christians function under the two God-ordained authorities. Jesus Christ is both ruler over the kings of this earth, and he has freed us from our sin by his blood and made us priests, he has made us a kingdom and priests before God. Both of those spheres are under Jesus Christ, and that's how we faithfully live them out as a church. We hold deep conviction, and find abiding comfort and peace in this truth that Jesus Christ is the ruler of kings. That's what's revealed to us in this book of Revelation. And it allows us to live in uncertain and difficult days in these last days at the end of time without any fear, no fear whatsoever. Jesus has done absolutely everything, it's telling us in verses 5 and 6. Jesus has already done everything for us. He has freed us from our sin. He's established us as his kingdom here on earth and for all of eternity. These are truths that we desperately need in difficult last days.
Jesus Christ is ruler over kings, and he's ruler over the redeemed. I want to look next at verse 7. We've moved all the way through verses 1 through 6. Listen to verse 7. It says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. Well, here we have one of the greatest comforts in the entire New Testament. And it's found in the revelation of Jesus Christ. He is coming. He's coming. He has not abandoned us. He has not abandoned this creation to its own sin and to its own destruction. He will return. Well, even more specifically, in the original Greek, the tense is uh, more of a sense of perpetual present. In other words, it's like, it's like he is always, even now, returning. Do you hear that in the, in the scripture? He is coming. In one sense, there is a day when Jesus will return in fullness and bring with him the culmination of his kingdom and set everything aright. But throughout all of John's writings, there is this present reality to the kingdom of God. He is right now coming. Moments when Jesus in his coming kingdom breaks through into our world and even into our very lives. Those moments are being redeemed even now. That's what this revelation is telling us in Jesus Christ. Well, there is coming a day when every eye will see him. Did you hear that in verse 7? Every eye will see him. That's a consistent truth that we're told throughout the New Testament. Back in Philippians 2, we're told that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And what we'll see unfold in this book of Revelation is this revelation of Jesus Christ that every eye will see him when he comes, verse 7, that every tribe will behold him, but some will see him and behold him and declare him to be Lord now to their salvation. But everyone else will declare him Lord on that day to their damnation. No one is left out from the return of Christ. He is coming. He's coming to demonstrate what's been true throughout all of history, that he holds dominion and sway, that he rules over everything and everyone and everything in all of his creation. Verse 7 says, even we, the ones for whom he was pierced, he's coming. Well, friends, when we find ourselves in desperate need for some form of stability or comfort, sometimes we mindlessly turn to our phones or our devices and we just we scroll news feeds, hoping subconsciously to find some kind of placation or peace or stability in that, right? Other times we turn to a gluttonous diet of information and news, trying to suss out the deeper story and the story behind the story and somehow hoping that in that we can find peace and stability and strength. Well, there's nothing to be found there. God tells John through an angel to tell us that everything from beginning to end is the Lord Jesus Christ. That means, first of all, that he is in control. Secondly, that he holds his people safely in the palm of his hand. And thirdly, and this is the point that I want to finish on, that everything in this world looks like him that everything in time and everything in creation is cross-shaped. I want to drill into that for a moment. I hear from Christians regularly who in these last days, in these end times, in these tumultuous days, um, are surprised by the suffering and by the hurt and by the loss. They look at the broken world and they think, oh my goodness, there's coming a persecution and what on earth are we going to do? It's coming out of nowhere. Well, we should never be surprised. That's what happened to Jesus. And this revelation of John says 
that Jesus is the beginning and the end. Verse 8, the Alpha and the Omega, everything is always only ever about him. And so all of history is shaped by the contours of the cross. But let me say that a different way. Suffering for Jesus led to resurrection and to glory. And the same is true of the church living in this time in history, that it will be suffering that leads to new life and to glory. And so the revelation of Jesus Christ makes sense of these last days. And, and if I could encourage you with one thing, over these next months as we look at this book of Revelation, hear this message. Hear the revelation of Jesus Christ. Persevere in faith. Jesus is coming.